In this video, we're going to examine uh, properties of water and mixtures as associated with the body. So a, mix a mixture is substances that are physically blended but not chemically combined. So while we were looking at molecules earlier on, those are associated with chemical bonding. Um, and it, that would require um, a chemical reaction to either form those bonds or break those bonds. Mixtures are different because they don't need chemical reactions. They just need to be physically mixed in some way or another. And so as we talk about these mixtures, we discuss each component as one of two items. Either it's the solvent, the substance greatest, pre present in the greatest amount, or a solute, so a substance that is in the lesser amount. Often it's the substance that is dissolved within the solvent. I'll go ahead and mention here that water is the universal solvent. Um, and that's because water is pretty fantastic. Here's a number of characteristics about water that make it great as the solvent within our body's fluids. So to begin with, it's polar. We've discussed this already. That, of course, is because each water molecule has electronegative regions here with the oxygen, as well as electropositive regions where the hydrogen atoms would be. Um, so any kind of a polar molecule like water is really good at interacting with other polar polar molecules, as well as interacting with anything that is ionized, like a positively charged sodium cation or a negatively charged chloride anion. Now, of course, as you can see in this image, this um, dual nature of a water molecule is going to cause it to interact with those ions with a different um, three-dimensional position. And so here with this positively charged sodium um, cation, you see it's the electronegative region of your water molecule with the oxygen that faces that. So negatives facing positives. However, as you take a look here at this negatively charged chloride ion, it's those positive hydrogens of your water molecule that face that. So once again, opposites, electropositive to negative. Anytime you have water molecules that are forming rings like this around ions, we refer to that as a hydration sphere. And that allows those ions to stay more or less dissolved within space. Recall that we said that ionic bonds are easily broken when water is added. Well, this is the reason why, the chemistry of water being a polar molecule. Now, the idea here that water is a universal solvent is also associated with its ability to utilize hydrogen bonds. So it can hydrogen bond to other substances, and that's what we refer to as adhesion, and that's what we're going to see as water um, within your blood adheres to the walls of blood vessels or as it's going to adhere to the walls of the lung, creating um, a pressure, essentially holding your lungs open. Um, or water is associated with cohesion when you have molecules of that same substance substance, like water molecules, clinging to one another. This is what's going to cause water droplets to form when you spill water onto the floor or onto the cabinet. And that's all, again, because of the hydrogen bonds that are formed between neighboring water molecules. Water is chemically reactive. Um, we tend to think of it as being neutral, but that's the opposite of what water does for us in our body. So just in the same way that water would be able to separate uh, positive and negative charges for ions like uh, those associated with sodium chloride, we find that water has the ability to buffer pH. Now, as we study pH in a minute, we're going to see that pH is associated with the concentration of positively charged hydrogen ions or negatively charged hydroxyl ions. Now, depending on which one of these is in greatest amount, that can cause you to have a higher or a lower pH. Well, water in itself can actually ionize and form individual ions like this, thus affecting your pH. Now we say that it tends to work as a pH buffer, which means water is really good at balancing the pH of your body, um, as well as uh, helping to reach a sense of equilibrium between chemical reactions associated with pH. We find that water has a great deal of thermal stability, um, so it's going to help maintain our body temperature. And this is without any kind of a homeostatic mechanism. That's because it's got a high heat capacity, so it requires a lot of heat energy to cause all the water in your body to actually start raising temperature, right? So your body does not raise temperature easily. In addition to that, it has a high heat of vaporization, meaning 
as your body temperature does actually rise to a high enough point that it might raise uh, water compartments in temperature, that water begins to evaporate, carrying that heat energy off with it. And so, of course, we see this in action as we sweat, but both of these components of water um, once again, helping to maintain our body temperature despite changes in our environment. And so as we begin to look at mixtures um, that range from blood to the solutions in our cells, we find that uh, they all tend to be associated with water as the solvent for all the reasons we just looked at. Now, depending on what kinds of solute particles are mixed in with water, we're going to classify these mixtures as either a solution, a colloid, or a suspension. So to begin with right here, these are going to differ based on solute particle size. Solutions have the smallest solute particle size, while suspensions tend to have the largest. And the characteristics that are inferred from here are this. The smaller the solute particle, right, the less likely they are to be visible. And that's written here as whether or not they scatter light. So if they're very small, light does not bounce off of them, meaning you can't see them. Um, and so you tend to look at a mixture like this, and it's going to look just like water because you can't see the solute particles. Now, as you move up to a colloid, those particles do scatter light, and it will look cloudy. This is also true for a suspension with the largest size particles. Now, as we move on from that, we find that those solute particles do have the ability to travel back and forth throughout the mixture, and in some cases, diffuse through membranes that are associated with dividing mixtures throughout the body. The solutes that are the smallest do have the ability to pass through a membrane, but as they get bigger, they lose the ability to pass through those tiny spaces. Now, of course, with these solution solute particles, those being very, very small, they're very good at spreading all the way out through a solution. And uh, what we refer to this as is, is a homogeneous solution indicating that those solute particles never ever settle out, meaning they don't fall to the bottom um, when they've been mixed into a solution. They stay completely spread out. The particles that are associated with a colloid are exactly like this. They remain spread out in a homogeneous mixture. But then, of course, as you look at a suspension with the largest size particles, those are going to cause, um, create what's referred to as a heterogeneous type of a mixture. Uh, the particles are so large that they eventually fall to the bottom or settle out as time goes by. So of course examples here with the body are very important. When you're looking at these individual very small chemicals that are dissolved in your blood plasma, you can't see them. So things like sodium chloride, glucose, oxygen gas, carbon dioxide. If you were to withdraw blood plasma, um, as you would see with plasma chloresis, and examine that, you would not be able to see these particles. That's because they are too small. They're going to spread out evenly, they're going to be homogeneous, and they do fit the criteria of solution. Now let's assume we extract that blood plasma and we're looking for something different. Um, if we're looking for albumin, which is a pretty large protein within that blood plasma, we find that that particular, particular mixture of items is referred to as a colloid. So albumin forms a colloid within your blood plasma, remaining homogeneous but still becoming large enough um, that it can make your blood plasma look cloudy as the levels of albumin begin to rise. And then finally, if you extract whole blood instead of just blood plasma, you take with that large cells such as erythrocytes. Erythrocytes are so large that they do settle out and they are visible. And so when you take whole blood with erythrocytes intact, we refer to that as a heterogeneous solution. So of course, it's important for you to be able to identify for me what kind of a solution we are looking, or what kind of a mixture we're looking at, depending on the examples that I give to you here. So pull out a sheet of paper, and I want you to write down lecture question number one, right at the very top. And I want you to answer the following question for me on this sheet of paper. You're going to answer a couple of more questions like this in one of these, in these lectures. So hold on to this sheet of paper until you're finished watching these videos. So glucose dissolved in your blood plasma is going to be an example of a mixture in which A, solute particles scatter light, B, the distribution of solute is homogeneous, C, 
solute particles will eventually settle out over time? Or is it D, both A and B are true? Or E, both B and C are true? You may want to pause this video for a second, look back through your notes, and choose your answer. Write your answer letter down beside where it says question number one on your sheet of paper and hold on to it. Once you've answered the question, press play again and move on to lecture question number two. Lecture quiz question number two, um, you're going to answer in the same way. Just write down lecture question two and, and select the letter choice here that you think is the most correct. Erythrocytes floating in your blood plasma would be an example of a mixture in which A, these solute particles do scatter light, B, the distribution of solute is homogeneous, C, these solute particles, the erythrocytes, will eventually settle out over time. Is it a combination of A and B? Select D. Or for E, is it a combination of B and C? So pause the video and make your choice. Write down the letter choice that you have beside lecture question number two, and then hold on to that sheet of paper. Once you've answered the question, you can go ahead and continue with the rest of the videos.